As most of Baton Rouge citizens return back to work from Independence Day weekend, I wanted to give you an update on public safety and to address uh, some of the recent incidents of violence that have occurred in our community over the weekend. Uh, every person associated with the Baton Rouge Police Department is committed to eliminating the culture of violence in our city. And it's a cycle that must be broken, a cycle that unfortunately has been in this community for far too long. The men and women of the Baton Rouge Police Department work hard to serve the people of our communities. However, this work cannot happen without the help of the public, the community, the people that we serve. And your willingness to talk with us and stand with us has been very essential. I am encouraged by the tips and the interactions on our social media that we receive from the community on a daily basis and the calls uh, that go in uh, to our detectives or uh, the concerned citizens that walk up to our police officers and provide information. I am encouraged by that. So I want to say keep talking Baton Rouge because we will never ever stop listening. We have been working hard to address violence in this city, initiatives like our patrol strategies that have been in effect since the second week of March. The patrol strategy covers what we call micro areas in our community, and it's identified in all four districts. Each micro area is a subzone that has been the most active regarding actual calls for services regarding violent crime and property crime. The patrol patterns officers use with this concern areas identified and stored. And these are patrols that are highly visible in the most active windows of time for calls for service. We also launched Operation Safe Summer. Operation Safe Summer started the third week of May. And here are a few details about Operation Safe Summer. We use statistics driven data that puts officers in the most active areas during the busiest times. It encompasses officers' presence, patrol, necessary enforcement, as well as community policing, policing and relations. Street crimes, our narcotics section, our shot spotter, our rapid response team are working in conjunction with the uniformed patrol officers for additional manpower, resources, and follow-up. As the culture of violence impacts our city and country, I would like to ensure the people of this community that we're doing everything possible to apprehend the violent offenders in our community. To this end, we need the assistance of the community. If you know someone who is thinking of committing a crime, or if someone has communicated his intentions to you, we ask that you call Crime Stoppers at 344-STOP. That's Crime Stoppers 344-7467. Be assured that your identity will be kept anonymous. And please know that we're doing everything we can to keep our streets safe. It is our oath to you. Now I would like to introduce you to some of the other heroes in our community. You know, I just talked about the work that we're doing in the Baton Rouge Police Department uh, to help get a handle on this, uh, but we cannot do it alone. And I've heard too often that where are the voices or where are the screams of where is the outrage when it comes to crime in our community? Well, since I've been here, I know that we have people in our community, boots on the ground, who are doing their part to help stop this cycle of violence in Baton Rouge. And I'm going to introduce them to you, and I'm going to ask them to speak because there's a lot of great work going on in the community. And with some of the successes that we've had in the work that they're doing uh, in our community, I am confident that we will get through this. We are in some unprecedented times right now with the COVID-19 uh, and the stress and anxiety that it, that it has created uh, in our community. But I want you to hear from the people in the community who are sick and tired of the violence that's happening in the community. And they're not just talking about it. They're doing something about it. And we're going to ask first uh, the Apostle uh, Sheila Parker, who's with our Save Our Sons 911, followed by Emmanuel Boo Milton, followed by the representatives from the Change Organization, followed by the Butterfly Fly Society, followed by Iris, and then followed by the Bridge Agency. And we're going to start in that order. Uh, order uh, 
possible. Good evening, good evening, everyone. I am Apostle Sheila Parker, Save Our Son, 911. We are here, we're talking about tell your son not to kill my son. And I'll tell my son not to kill your son. Tell your daddy not to kill my daddy. And I'll tell my daddy not to kill your daddy. We need our men. We are here to make an impact in our communities throughout the city of Baton Rouge. We're here to bring forth change. And we need the help of everyone that is a part of each community. So we're asking those, reach out to us. We're here for you. We do have a website. We do have a uh, Facebook set up, Save Our Sons 911 on Facebook. We also, my phone number is 225-288-1056. We're looking to make an impact, and we look forward to hearing from you. I'm Cleve Dunn, Jr., uh, partner of Saving Our Sons. Queen Sheila is the starter and originator of the organization. Let me be clear, Saving Our Sons is not our goal and our mission to solve violent crimes or murders and do the police's job. It's our, it's our mission to reduce the caseload as it relates to murders. When we find out that there are conflicts and beefs in the community based on our personal relationships, it's our goal to intervene and stop the killing and stop the violence, be a trusted voice that the community can turn to to prevent a crime or a killing or bodily harm from happening. That's our goal at Saving Our Sons, and we look forward to impacting our community in Banks and as well as the broader community in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Thank you. Hello, um, Emmanuel Milton, also known as Boo Milton, community organizer, advisory board member for National Initiative Cities United that focuses on the reduction of the homicide rate nationally amongst African American men. Um, so in a line of work that I do, you know, we educate people on what violence reduction actually looks like. So before I could even speak on the work that I do and for us to even have an appreciation for all the work that everybody up here does, we have to actually know what we mean when we say public safety and what we mean when we say looking at violence as a public health issue. So the first thing is knowing what public safety is and knowing that public safety is not synonymous with law enforcement. Public safety is something that we need to uh, all have a stake in. Uh, whether it's the after school program, the schools, no matter what it is, we all have a stake in public safety. And uh, whenever we all take on that is whenever we really start to see a change in our community. And the next thing is knowing what, pub uh, knowing what violence being looked at as a public health issue really means. Um, and basically what that means is looking at it as violence as an illness. Whenever someone is sick, you don't just tell them to go inside the house. They have to be cured. What are we doing to cure our communities? Because whenever we call law enforcement, by the time that happens, either somebody is going to jail or somebody's already dead. So whenever we, whenever violence is happening and we continue to send certain law enforcement, that is adding more surveillance and more containment. We need actual cures for the violence in our community. So if someone is sick and you tell them to stay in the house, they need the proper medication, they need the proper healing. So what we are doing and these organizations do, we provide the proper healing once someone is in a safe location. So it's a partnership here. So what does curing look like? Well, the proper allocation of funds in our school systems, um, better quality of life and better quality of place for our, uh, for the uh, for our citizens in our cities and uh, you know, investing in these disinvested areas. So that's what the work looks like. If you want uh, to reach out to me, info at BooMilton.com. Hi, my name is Sateria Tate Alexander. I'm here with Liz Robinson, and we represent Change, which is communities healing and nurturing growth through edification. Um, this organization was organized back in 2019 by families and community members who've been impacted by violence in our communities. What we are doing is working with our community to identify some of the issues that are creating the problems that we're seeing and causing the violence in our communities. We are partnering with East Baton Rouge Parish um, Police Department um, to start bridging the gap and building 
um, a better relationship between them. But first, we're starting within our own communities. And I'll let Liz take it from here. Okay. On July the 18th at 8.30 a.m., um, we're meeting up at um, in the front of City Hall. We're going to have a march called Solidarity March. And that's, don't forget about our babies. My son was murdered in 2018, so I am a a mother, um, excuse me. I'm a mother that comes from a crime family. My, my son was murdered on Cadillac Street in 2018. So I come because I want the mothers, because we're the ones that still feeling this pain every day. And I want us to come together, not just the mothers, the, fa the fathers, the cousins. I want us to come stand as one and put the guns down and try to, you know, bring our communities back together. Um, and um, change. You can meet. You can. Um, you can get us. Get in touch with us at Change um, on Facebook. Our Instagram is Change VR two two five. Our phone number is two six seven seven two five two. And our email is Change VR two two five at gmail dot com. Um, I'm here for mothers. I'm here for fathers. I mean, I get calls every day about somebody's child's been killed. And it's time out. We have to put the guns down. We have to call Crime Stopper because the, the, the killers are still out there. And until we come together as a community and start calling these numbers and saying, okay, I'm tired of Joe Blow on my corner killing people. Because guess what? If he killed my son, he's coming to kill somebody else's son. So we all need to come together as a community. You know, um, the other group was saying they, they take calls. You know, if you got a beef with somebody, we take calls also. If you got a beef, call me. If I can get with another mother and explain to her what her child is going, what her child is planning to do, that's another murder that I've helped not to happen. You know, so that that's what we're here for, you know, to bridge that gap between our community and the police department. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Tawana Harris, founder and executive director of the Butterfly Society, a nonprofit domestic violence organization here in our great city of Baton Rouge, established in 2014. First, I would like to thank Chief Paul and his staff for making this opportunity possible for us. He's going to kill me. These words are recorded in my mind. They play over and over and over again. I want to leave, but I can't. I can't because my family no longer associates with me, because I've gone back many times. I can't leave because my pastor tells me to work it out. Things will get better. And by the way, God frowns on divorces. I can't leave because I love him. I pray daily that he will change. I can't leave because I'm powerless. I'm fearful. I can't leave because he tells me he will kill me. These are the words of a victim that I spoke to this morning before coming here. The Butterfly Society is a volunteer-based organization. We are committed, we're invested, and we're passionate about the work we do. Many of us, volunteers and board members, and myself included, have walked in the shoes of a victim. We have traveled the journey. We have found ourselves in a position of making a decision, should we remain or should we leave? As an organization, we provide services that are tailored to victims because we've been there ourselves. There's a 24-hour hotline. Our contact number is 225-347-7725. We provide advocacy, counseling, information and referrals, legal services, outreach, safety planning, shelter, and support groups. When I tell you, no one signs up for this. No one does. No one wakes up in the morning and say, this is what I plan for my life to be. Many years ago, I had a survivor to say to me, Ms. Harris, I didn't run to domestic violence. I woke up in it. That's someone's reality as I speak to you in this very moment. Domestic violence is real in our community. As a community, what are you going to do? 
In closing, I want to leave this with you. If you see something, say something. If you know something, do something. But to absolutely do nothing makes you part of the problem, not the solution. Thank you. I'm John Price. I'm the executive director of the Iris Domestic Violence Center. Iris Domestic Violence Center is a 501c nonprofit founded in 1981 as the Battered Women's Clinic. It was founded as a result of a commission that studied women's problems in the end of the 1970s decade, and they came up with the idea that the biggest problem they had at that time was the need for a shelter for women who were being battered. Forty years later, we're here, and still that's one of the major problems with regard to violence and crime in East Baton Rouge Parish. The Irish Domestic Violence Center focuses on providing services to victims of domestic abuse and family violence, intimate partner violence. We don't discriminate. We don't, uh, it doesn't matter your age, your race, your uh, gender, your color, it doesn't matter. We provide services non-discriminatory to any individual that qualifies for our services. Our services include a 24-hour crisis line manned by trained advocates who can answer any questions or provide information or referral to individuals. The phone number for the crisis line, and I'm going to repeat it a few times, is 389-3001. If you're at home, if you hear this message, if you see this on a video, if you're watching Facebook, you have a question about domestic abuse or violence, I'm asking you to call that number. It may save your life. We have the crisis line. We have a 24-hour safe house shelter where we provide safety and support and services to individuals who are seeking to escape an abusive situation. We've been doing that for years. We do not close. We don't close at 5 o'clock. We don't close on the weekends. We don't close on holidays. We did not close for COVID-19. We provide safety planning. We provide case management. We provide referral services to outside agencies that partner with us who can provide support and services to victims of domestic abuse and family violence. It's a big problem in this nation, it's a big problem in this state, and it's a big problem in this parish. It's a community problem and it's going to take a community solution. Every minute in the United States, 20 people are undergoing physical abuse by an intimate partner every minute. That's 10 million people a year. Every day, there are 20,000 phone calls placed to domestic violence service agencies like ours. We are one of 15 in this state, and we belong to the Louisiana Coalition Against Domestic Violence. It's a big problem. In East Baton Rouge Parish over the past four years, I know of at least 34 people who lost their lives as a result of domestic abuse and family violence. And last year, I think there were over 2,400 cases reported to law enforcement. And that's just the cases that are reported. I don't have to tell you that there are plenty more where people don't report out of the fears that you've talked to want to talk about. Abuse is a real life and death situation. COVID-19 hit, and one of the big concerns was what was going to happen. And I will tell you that, as we anticipated, crisis calls went up, service requests went up. We housed 23 individuals in the first three months of, 20, of 2020. We've housed 59 individuals in the second quarter. The crisis calls went up, the request for services went up. We can provide safety, we can provide security, and we can provide you with options when you leave the abuser. That may not have been the case five or ten years ago, but we've upped the level of our services. We put six families in flex housing who were leaving an abuser in the last 60 days, and we put 29 individuals in apartments and in houses to provide them assistance, because otherwise 
you're either going back to the abuser or you're going to fend for yourself on the street. And that's not always a viable option with children. 389-3001. We're there 24 hours a day. It's what we do. Or you can look us up at stopdv.org. Please give us a call. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Professor Alvarez Herzog. I'm with the Bridge Agency uh, here today with founder and director Nicole Scott and one of our student representatives, uh, Montreal. Um, proud to be a partner of the Bridge Agency, uh, first and foremost because the constituents in which they serve are our students and our children. Uh, to me, the, the most important constituents because that is our future, not only in this city but in this world. And so what the Bridge Agency stresses on doing is addressing uh, the trauma, the mental, and emotional stresses that uh, black youth in particular experience uh, when it comes to violence, all types of violence, uh, whether it's violence in the community, violence uh, through law enforcement, or just violence in general. Um, and so what we've done as an organization over the past five years, um, myself being a recent member of it, um, is bringing in all community stakeholders from Chief Murphy Paul to the mayor of, of Baton Rouge, Sharon Weston, Broome. Um, we have psychologists, we have um, other instructors, professors at K-12 levels or uh, other community leaders, uh, Gina McLaughlin, who work with us um, to answer the questions that our children have. Oftentimes it's, just, it's the students who uh, cry out the most, but whose voices get left unheard. And so, um, so grateful to be a part of an organization that lifts the voices of children, their concerns, and connects them with hope, inspiration. Um, and if you can find us on social media, uh, we have Facebook, Instagram pages, um, the Bridge Agency, and uh, we will look forward to partnering with as many people as we can uh, to help uh, mend and bridge the gap uh, between a lot of what's going on in our community, between the youth and between law enforcement, because we know that there are no enemies uh, amongst us here uh, who are all allies if we wish uh, to build a safer and better place for all of us. Thank you. I won't say this in closing. I remember when I was young, we used to have a saying, it takes a village. It takes a village to raise a child. And I know I was at an event the other day, and I think we miss it at some time. I remember when I was young, you know, your neighbor could discipline you, and then you go home and you get disciplined the second time, or even mm -hmm. time a third time if you had a two-parent home where double and triple jeopardy uh, 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 was, was, was common in, in, in terms of, of, of dealing with uh, our youth as a community. And now we are in a place in society now where we can't even tell somebody else's kid anything. And we got families where you can't even tell someone else in your family child that we got to bring it back to those values those values where we as a community collectively are holding each other accountable I wrote down some words that I heard from everybody behind me and I'm going to repeat them here I heard cure that's that New Orleans accent excuse me but <laughs> C-U-R-E cure <laughs> violence interrupters we're addressing causes for problems. I heard relationship building, awareness, bringing together mothers and fathers and loved ones, coming together, uniting stakeholders, put the guns down, addressing trauma, change, conflict resolution. All of those words were heard from our partners behind us. The Baton Rouge Police Department cannot do this alone. And anybody who expects that, that is an unrealistic expectation, not only for me as a chief, but any chief that came before me or any chief that's going to come after me. Crime is a social economic issue, and it is bigger than law enforcement. Please understand that. The change is going to happen in this community, and it is happening in this community. We are dealing with some unprecedented times right now. I believe we were on the right course, and let me make sure I'm clear. Overall crime in the city of Baton Rouge is down. Those are facts right now. The data shows that overall is crime. We do have some uh, areas of concern, and specifically those areas are homicides. Our homicides are right around this time last year, we had about a little over 30, and right now we're sitting at 45 uh, homicides. But what stands out about that is 52%, I want you to remember this, 52% of 
over 42% happen inside of a house, inside of a residence. And when you throw in uh, an ad, uh, the, the, the yard, the front porch, you're looking at about 54% of homicides happen either in the yard or inside the house. Domestics are hurting us right now. That's why you just heard from two of our uh, domestic uh, violence, uh, nonprofit organizations. And when I look at the numbers, I can't help but think the impact that stress and anxiety is causing in this community because of the COVID-19 crisis is uh, uh, somehow influencing those numbers that I just gave you. We can do better. But I want to end with closing before we take questions. What I have here is our 2020 report to the community. And you can go to our website, Baton Rouge Police Department, and pick it up. Because when we see what's going on around America, I want to highlight the building trust and legitimacy that we have already started in the city of Baton Rouge. We understand that there is room for improvement, but we do recognize that there are uh, some steps that we have taken in the right direction that other law enforcement agencies all around are trying to do now. When it comes to building trust and legitimacy, body camera program, we have a check mark. And I'm going to show this to you because it's, it's important. Because this is what's going on around the country right now when it comes to building trust and legitimacy. Body cameras, we have them. De-escalation training, procedure justice training, early intervention system. Officers must give a verbal warning. Officers cannot use chokeholds. We have a chief advisory council where we listen to the community. Some of the members behind you are on that council. Online complaint process to make it easier to file complaints. A comprehensive reporting, duty to intervene, and police cannot shoot at, at moving vehicles. Not only do we have a responsibility to intervene, our police officers are required to report it. They're required to report it by policy, not just in training, but in policy. We are doing our part to build legitimacy and uh, uh, to build trust and legitimacy in this community. But we still have a long way to go. But I want to thank our officers for making that change. I really do. Um, because we're moving forward. But we need help from the community. Please, please support uh, uh, all the agencies that are behind us. Get the help you need. There are so many opportunities for intervention. And I think we can do it. Now we'll take questions. You know, I think, a, is there a way that someone in the community has access to all of this information, or is that kind of part of this, of, of trying to make that information available to people kind of in a situation like y'all are describing? Sure. So what we can do, and it's, it's, first of all, it's a good question. Uh, what we'll do is we will put on our website and also on our social media, uh, we're here in the Real Time Crime Center, we'll make sure that all the contact information for all of our partners are, are on our social media platforms as well as our, our website so that you can contact any agency here. And a lot of things that we're talking about are actually highlighted in the Baton Rouge Police Department 2020 report to the community. You can access this online on our website as well. We also have copies for you before you leave. Do you think the pandemic is really um, part of this spike in, in homicides and, and some of the recent crime? Because I know summertime we normally see kind of a spike, but it kind of came early this year, it seems. Yeah, well, you know what's interesting? It, if you look at the last two summers, they've been our safest summers in decades. So if you go back and you look at uh, summer last year, summer before that, uh, they were our lowest uh, months for homicides uh, compared to the rest of the year. But when we look at summer, we put a lot of effort into uh, uh, crime prevention efforts, a lot of community projects. We had basketball with the Basketball with the badge, bowling with bowling with the badge, uh, boxing with the badge. Over 300 community events we did last year and the year before. And a lot of those events in the summertime because we know our kids are out of school, so we try to engage them and make sure they're busy doing something. So we believe uh, many of those programs uh, helped in the summer. Unfortunately, we have this thing called COVID-19 right now, and we're not able to engage the community how we've engaged the past two summers. Uh, I do think that this COVID crisis is creating a lot of stress, uh, a lot of anxiety uh, in the community. Uh, we've interrupted people's normalcy, you know, how we uh, used to do a business. And I, I think these are some of the uh, uh, 
consequences behind uh, changing uh, on people's daily routine. Chief, is the big thing that kind of concerns you about the, the high number of homicides, is it what you were talking about, kind of about how they're 40% or more kind of happening near or at a home? Talk about that. What's kind of your big concern with the numbers right well, now? Well, I, I think when you look at those numbers, when you start talking about homicides inside the house, in many of those cases, um, the, the, the perpetrator in those cases probably uh, has a relationship with the victim in those cases. So that does concern me. Uh, it's actually 42, over 42 percent happen inside the residence and right around 12 percent uh, right, right outside either on the porch or in the yard. Uh, that's what that tells us. But look, I, uh, you know, our clearance rates uh, uh, this year alone are probably around uh, uh, more than 60, uh, probably about 65, 66 percent. Uh, we solved nine homicides this year that happened in previous years. And, and, you know, when you start getting into those 60s and uh, I believe 65, 66 this year, that doesn't help without the community calling, without somebody picking up the phone, calling our detectives, without uh, the partnership that we have uh, with the community members behind us. Would you tell someone who's thinking about committing a crime or doing something like that in Baton Rouge, you're going to find them? Or I'm sorry, say, say that again, sir? What would you say? I can't speak with this mask. What would you say to uh, someone who's thinking about committing a crime in Baton Rouge? You guys are going to find them or something like that, Chief? What's your message, Connor? To well, I listen to what they say. That's my message. Listen to this press conference, what everybody behind me said. There are opportunities. You need help. Every single person here offered help. You want help? Help is right behind me right now. Standing behind me saying, we're here to help you. Here we are. Give us an opportunity to help change. So if you're a family member or a loved one of someone who has communicated and intent to commit an act, you have an opportunity to save a life, and you have an opportunity to change the life of that person around you right now. Take them up on their offer. Okay? Thank you for your time.